Welcome to Felony Friday, a presentation of the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here is your host, John Odermatt. Welcome, felons, friends, and freedom lovers. Thank you for joining me once again for yet another edition of Felony Friday here on the Lions of Liberty podcast. Today, I have a guest who has had a career that has spanned both the civil and criminal justice system, but he is probably best known for his work as an author and as an expert witness on false confessions. Now, before I introduce my guest, I do want to let everyone know where they can find the show notes for today's episode. This is episode number 23, so you know that means you can find these show notes at lionsofliberty.com slash FF23. My guest today is Alan Hirsch. Alan is a professor, attorney, and author. He is a graduate of Amherst College. He graduated with a BA in philosophy, and he graduated from Yale Law School. He is currently chair of the Justice and Law Studies program at Williams College, where he has taught constitutional law. Alan has published six books, a dozen scholarly articles in law journals, and more than 20 op-eds and magazine articles on various aspects of the legal system. These articles have appeared in the LA Times, the Washington Post, Washington Times, and Newsday. His latest book is called The Duke of Wellington Kidnapped, the incredible true story of the art heist that shocked a nation. During Allen's career, he embraced aspects of both civil and criminal justice reform. However, Allen's focus has shifted and is focused more on false confessions. He has studied and written about false confessions extensively. Alan has also assisted attorneys as an expert witness on false confessions, and he has been retained more than 100 times in a dozen different states. Alan, welcome to Felony Friday. Glad to be with you. Well, it's great to have you here, Alan. It's great to have you on the show. I think this is going to be an interesting episode. It's, it's interesting for me, and I think our listeners will find it interesting as well, because I think false confessions is a topic that really, it doesn't get a lot of play. I don't think it's really a topic because, you know, a lot of people don't notice it as a, a problem, as a problem in the criminal justice system. And the purpose of this show, as I talk about a lot, is to shine light on injustice in the broken criminal justice system. And I think false confessions is definitely one avenue that we find injustice. So I'm sure you'll help us shine some light on that today and explain for us farther. Before we get to that, before we get to talking about false confessions, I just wanted to get a, uh, for the Felony Friday audience, to get a better idea of who you are and, and how you started out down this road. What first triggered your passion about the law and wanting to become an attorney? I think you mentioned I was a philosophy major in college, and this is now going back uh, more than three decades and I wanted to pursue philosophy, but at the time, the job market was terrible. And going to law school, particularly at Yale, which emphasized the idea aspect of the law rather than legal practice, they weren't preparing lawyers, they were preparing people who thought about the law deeply. So that seemed to me kind of a compromise between doing philosophy and uh, being practical. Um, so I pursued law that uh, to that extent, and ever since I've been doing a non-traditional legal activities, I suppose you could say. Okay. And then, so how long did it take for you to really start to channel most of your energies towards false confessions? So what, at what point did your career start to take that turn? And was there any one thing that really led to that? I think it goes back a little bit more than a decade. And uh, I was had come to Williams College largely following my wife, uh, who got a job here. And I was a, largely a writer and could, therefore my work was portable. And when I got here, I quickly realized uh, that that one of her colleagues at Williams was Professor Saul Kasson, who's probably the world's leading authority on false confessions. And I remember one day picking up the New York Times and seeing an, an op-ed by him about the Central Park Jogger case, a case in which five false confessions were given and teenagers who gave detailed confessions to something they didn't do. And, you know, that fascinates a lot of people. I was already somewhat knowledgeable about the subject because uh, when I was a law clerk, we had a case that went up to the Supreme Court on the voluntariness of a confession. Um, so when I realized I had this colleague who was deeply into it, I began to pick his brain and read his work. And before long, it became a fascination of mine that, you know, I really had 
to pursue on a regular basis. I started writing about it. And then after I'd been writing about it for several years, had several scholarly articles published, I thought it's time to put this knowledge to use directly and start assisting people who may have given false confessions. And one thing led to another. And before you know it, I was an expert in the field. And so I am. Yeah, a lot of people don't really understand maybe how big of an issue this is, how common it is. It's it's more common than people think, people giving um, false confessions. And I was reading through your your website, and your website is truthaboutfalseconfessions.com. And I was reading through your frequently asked questions section. And one of the questions that jumped out to me, and I'd I'd like your answer on it, but I won't read it here. I'll let you respond to it, obviously. But so what is the biggest misconception about false confessions that people have? Oh, there are a lot of them. But I think one is that only people who are mentally retarded or intellectually challenged or maybe particularly young, that there are these very vulnerable groups. But a regular old person of normal intelligence, normal upbringing and education and age would never confess to something they didn't do. And that's just not the case. You know, we find that it could happen to you or me, but for the grace of God, anyone under the right circumstances is capable of saying they did something they didn't do. In many cases, to escape what is otherwise feels like an impossible situation. And the sad thing about it is it results from widespread interrogation tactics. The way that police are trained to interrogate suspects unfortunately, is so effective at breaking people down that it can break down the innocent as well as the guilty. So it's not an accident that we're learning that false confessions are much more frequent than anyone had supposed. That is a scary thought. And I know you've written about on your website that, you know, the idea of a false confession, I agree, it it runs counterintuitive. You know, you wouldn't think if you're innocent, you know, the, the way to get out of it is by telling the truth. But we can talk more about some of these tactics that interrogators use a little later on. But First, I just wanted to ask you, what are some of the reasons why an innocent person, someone that knows they're innocent, why would they confess? The biggest reason is precisely these interrogation tactics. And the tactics are designed to make people feel that there's no way out except by confessing. And now I'm going to be condensing a 500-page interrogation manual into a couple paragraphs, if you'll permit me to. Go for it. Okay, so there's no doubt that this is oversimplified, but it comes down to largely interrogators making the suspect believe that nothing they say will convince the interrogators that they are innocent. They know they are guilty, that's all there is to it, and they're only going to make things worse if they maintain their innocence. And this will also come back with the claim to have objective evidence. You know, we have an eyewitness, we have your fingerprints, you flunked a polygraph. Whatever it takes to make the person think, we've got you and you're not going to convince us you're innocent. And then at the same time, they start to drop hints or sometimes even say explicitly that it won't be so bad if only you confess. And they can do this in any number of ways by suggesting that the victim provoked you, by suggesting that drugs or alcohol or other mitigating circumstances led you to commit the crime that you otherwise wouldn't have, by suggesting someone else was the primary culprit, you were only a, played a secondary role. There are all kinds of ways of doing what we call minimizing the offense. And the message that is sending is if you confess, you're going to get off fairly easily. Now think about this combination. You maintain your innocence, you will never convince us, you're going to face very severe consequences. But if you confess, it won't be that bad. If you actually come to believe that, and these are circumstances in in which your normal rational thought processes may not be applying, you're in a small windowless room surrounded by authority figures over a period of sometimes many hours, if you come to believe that the only way of getting out of a situation is to confess, well, then of course you will. It really comes down to a cost-benefit analysis, leading you to do something which later you will regret. But under the circumstances, it's very understandable. Now, if I may, you might ask, John, why would interrogators put someone through this when it's so potent at breaking them down? Aren't they concerned about breaking down innocent people? But one of the conceits about the leading schools of interrogation is that they only interrogate guilty people. They figure out who's innocent or guilty before the interrogation even begins during a screening interview in which they are watching your body language carefully and listening to verbal cues in response to certain stock questions. And they think they have this ability 
to screen out who's innocent or guilty before the interrogation begins. And the problem is it doesn't work. Study after study shows that even trained interrogators might as well be flipping a coin when it comes to assessing truthfulness based on body language or response to verbal cues. So what happens is a lot of people get through the filter. People who are innocent are believed to be guilty based on this inadequate means of discerning truthfulness. And now they are subject to the interrogation tactics, which are potent at breaking people down. And there it is. I mean, I hope I didn't go too fast. Obviously, uh, you know, people are encouraged to check out my website, truthaboutfalseconfessions.com, which spells this out as well. And then, of course, there's a recommended literature on the website where people can read about this in great depth. But I've tried to summarize it succinctly and give you some idea of why an innocent person might confess. So t- talking about this interrogation manual, just to make sure I'm understanding this properly, is this a, an actual, you know, is this a, a manual or you're, says you're talking figuratively or, or literally? Literally. There are any number of manuals. The leading one is by people called Reed and Associates, and they also have training sessions where they teach these same things. And this is very widespread among uh, you know, detectives being trained nationwide. I should add, John, that that's a major cause of false confessions or the interrogation tactics I've been discussing. But there are other false confessions that occur for other reasons. For example, there is what we call the voluntary false confession, where people come forward outside of an interrogative setting, just voluntarily show up at the police station and say, I did it, to something they didn't do. And that sounds crazy, too. But that happens. And, you know, the example we like to give when the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped, more than 200 people came forward and took credit, so to speak, for the kidnapping. And that's largely why uh, voluntary false confessions take place, a desire for notoriety. But it may also be to protect someone out of love or fear. Uh, There may be other reasons as well. So there's no shortage of reasons for false confessions. But we emphasize the one that is most avoidable. And that is the ones caused by certain interrogation tactics. Because if we could get the police to rethink these tactics, we could make a major, major dent in the problem of false confessions. If a person is subjected to these interrogation tactics, or if they you know, falsely confess for notoriety or, or out of fear or, or one of those other reasons, then they realize what happened after the fact. How can they reverse that? How can they prove their own false confession to be false? Yeah, yeah. The, the short story is it's usually too late. Um, so obviously, they go to trial and they recant the confession and they can hire experts like myself, and they should because it gives them a better chance. But it's always an uphill fight to convince a jury that a confession was false. We find in studies of proven false confessions, these are cases where after the fact, through DNA or some other means, we know the culprit was innocent. And when those cases go to trial, roughly 75 to 80 percent result in guilty verdicts. And even though these are cases where typically there's very little evidence because actually the person is innocent um, and nevertheless juries convict. And this is because it is so counterintuitive that an innocent person would confess. And that's why the important thing is to stop the false confession in the first place. We can talk about ways that we can make the system better able to deal with false confessions, but it's really important that these confessions not happen because once they do, they set in motion a series of events that's very hard to interrupt. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, last week on the show, my guest was Erin Murphy, and she's an expert in uh, DNA forensic typing. She wrote the book, Inside the Cell, The Dark Side of Forensic Data. And one thing that she talks about with DNA testing, you know, difference between medical and forensic with forensic DNA testing, there's a lot of chance for error. You know, she gave some examples of, you know, someone being confused, implicated in a murder simply because equipment used in an ambulance got the DNA of someone that was taken to a hospital and then a, a dead person that was murdered. And the person who was taken to the hospital first was implicated in the murder first. Have you seen any cases or heard of any cases where DNA was used to prove in air quotes that that somebody had committed a a crime and then was used to coerce a false confession? I don't know for sure about cases of mistaken DNA. What happens not infrequently is that the claim to have DNA is used to coerce a confession. And even more frequently, we see it with polygraphs. So what will happen is a suspect is asked, would you be willing to take a polygraph? You've been insisting on your innocence for all this time. Why not take a polygraph? 
And often, precisely because they are innocent, the suspect will say, sure, I'll take a polygraph. And then they're strapped up and they're asked some questions. And the polygrapher goes back and he looks at the charts or he doesn't even bother. And he comes back and he says, you know, you flunked the polygraph. And this, again, is this uh, confirms our conviction that you're guilty. It proves that you're guilty. You'll never convince us otherwise. And now this person thinks, oh, my God, on top of everything else, I flunked a polygraph. I'm really in trouble. And it may be they didn't flunk at all. So that's considered perfectly legit and legal. They can just lie about a a failed polygraph. All the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has said that lying to suspects is not by itself grounds for suppression of a confession. Now, they've said it's part of the total inquiry into whether a confession is voluntary. So a defense attorney can argue, look at all these lies the police told my client. It's usually a losing argument. I see this all the time, cases where the uh, detectives told a series of important lies about important evidentiary things, Um, things like DNA shows you're guilty or a polygraph shows you're guilty or someone's pointing at you or so, so forth. And these lies are not held to be grounds for keeping a confession out of evidence. Hmm. Interesting. So being an expert in uh, false confessions, being called as an expert witness by an attorney, uh, what types of things would they ask you? Um, What type of questions would they ask to get on the court record to try to get a false confession reversed? Right. Well, a lot depends on what the judge allows. So best possible case, I'll be allowed to give my opinion that a confession is unreliable and to explain why, which typically means trying to educate the jury on the interrogation tactics that were used, but also looking to how the confession doesn't match the evidence in the case and so forth. Often judges will say that's going too far, but what they will let you do is testify about the methods, interrogation methods that were used, or at least about what we know about why certain interrogation tactics are risky. Um, So it all depends on the particular case, but at a minimum, the, the goal is to be able to educate the jury about how false confessions are surprisingly frequent um, and about what we know about factors that contribute to them. Um, But when you say surprisingly frequent, is there data on this? You know, how many false confessions have there been since a certain date? Right. So the Innocence Project started, I believe it was in 1989, using DNA testing to prove or to test the claims of people who had been convicted of crimes but insisted they were innocent. And they have exonerated more than 300 people. And it turns out that roughly 25% of those had confessed. And this was you know, quite surprising. And in the universe of people who had been convicted wrongfully, uh, quite a few of them had confessed. And as a result, social scientists and legal scholars have been trying to identify proven false confessions. And there are several hundred have been identified. And we have every reason to believe that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, in most cases, mm-hmm. there's not DNA available. There's not ways of proving that a confession is false. And again, the more we learn about certain interrogation tactics, the more we have every reason to expect that there are people behind bars, quite a few, who are in fact innocent. So what are some ways that this can be overturned, this can be reversed? Are there any reforms that can be enacted to try to reduce the amount of false confessions? So one crucial reform is happening, thank goodness, and that is interrogations are being recorded. Um, in many, many jurisdictions. If we were having this conversation 10 years ago, I'd be telling you that police departments have to start recording interrogations, not just when the suspect's ready to confess. That's no time to turn on the camera, but from the very beginning, so the judge and jury can see what happened that led up to the confession. That's a very important reform. I think judges allowing experts to educate juries about false confessions, a lot of judges do, increasingly they do, but many still don't. That's an important reform. I think the single most important is the one I keep harping on is reform of interrogation practice. I think, um, because as I said, some of these other reforms may help us spot a false confession after it's happened, uh, but you want to prevent it before it happens. Right, of course. And uh, are you involved on on both sides, the defense, and or I guess I should phrase this a, d- a different way, not necessarily with false confessions to a crime, but with victims being coerced into saying that there was a crime that committed when maybe a crime wasn't committed at all against them. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, have you seen that happen at all? That, sure. False accusations are close cousins of false confessions, and we often see them in the same case. So someone, sometimes prodded by police, but often for other reasons altogether, will point the finger at someone. That leads the police to that suspect, and then um, they break him down. And now you've got a false confession and a false accusation in the same case. And what I will tell attorneys in, in helping them defend against these cases is something to say to the jury is zero plus zero equals zero. You know, sure, you have a confession and you have an accusation, but unless each of them is somewhat credible, that doesn't mean that you should be impressed by the sheer fact that there is both. Especially because it may very well have been the accusation that led to the confession in the first place. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, the, the one case that, that comes to mind that I was thinking of, I've had uh, John Ziegler on the show before talking about the Jerry Sandusky scandal. Mm -hmm. And one of the victims in that case, it was a child sex abuse scandal. I'm not sure if you're familiar with sure, it. Sure, of course. By national headlines. One of the victims in the case was present. His lawyer was present and the prosecutors are present. And what they did is they had the, the victim leave the room and the victim's attorney and the prosecutors, you know, talked about how do we get this person to admit that he was sexually abused? And it was all recorded. It was all mm -hmm. caught on the uh, official record. And I think the judge, and eventually the victim did say that he was sexually abused. And I think the judge in that case said that um, the testimony was allowable and they couldn't use it against the victim's character at all. So I thought that was very surprising. Have you come across any other cases like that? Not off the top of my head, but that sounds pretty egregious and fortunately probably not too common. But as I said, the issue of false accusations uh, is a serious one for sure. So let's shift gears a bit and, and talk about your new book, The Duke of Wellington Kidnapped, The Incredible True Story of an Art Heist That Shocked the Nation. I haven't read the whole book, but I've read uh, read some of it. It's a pretty interesting case, interesting read. This is a, and I guess I'll, I'll let you give the background story on it. So maybe first, before we get started on that, so what got you interested in this case to want to write a book about it? And maybe can you talk about um, what the actual art heist was and right. how it happened? I can sort of answer those questions simultaneously because what interested me in large part is that it's the most amazing story of an art theft that you'll ever encounter. And when I heard about it, and I'm, I'm an art historian as well as an attorney, as it happens, so it intersects my field. Um, so I was particularly interested in some of the great art crimes that have happened. And when I heard about this one, I couldn't believe it. And the more I looked into it, I still couldn't believe it. Uh, but the short story is that in 1961, there was the first ever theft from London's National Gallery, Goya's portrait of the Duke of Wellington, a painting that was uh, treasured in England, uh, was missing. And a year later, it shows up in the first James Bond film, I should say, which just gives you an idea of how this seized the imagination of, uh, of England. Um, four years later, someone comes forward and the, the painting is returned anonymously and a few, in 1965. And a few months later, someone comes forward and says, I did it. I'm the man who, uh, who took the Goya. Reading about this case had reason to believe, based on various things, that this person was not actually guilty, although he went to trial and was convicted. Um, so what we have here is what we were talking about earlier, a case of a voluntary false confession. Uh, or so I thought, and it turns out I don't want to give away too much about the case, but I can say that much. There was a voluntary false confession at the heart of the case. So this became all the more irresistible to me. It was not only a, a, a great story involving the legal system and a long, bizarre trial and involving a great work of art, um, but on top of all that, at its heart, was a false confession. So you could see it checked all the boxes for me personally. But I think it's a story that I, I've tried to make come alive for everybody, I hope, with some success. It's a good read. Like I said, I haven't finished it yet, but I plan on it. It's very interesting. The title is The Duke of Wellington Kidnapped, The Incredible True Story of the Art Heist that Shocked the Nation. Alan, before we say goodbye for the day, can you tell the Felony Friday audience where they can find out more about your work, more about uh, your articles, and uh, where they can buy the book? All right. So the book, uh, you know, Duke of Wellington Kidnapped on Amazon and I guess Barnes & Noble and any of the other usual suspects. Um, my work, you've been kind enough to plug my website a few times, but Truth About False Confessions, 
And I'd particularly like to hear from any attorneys who have clients who've recanted their confessions and wh whether or not you would be interested in retaining me. I'm happy to talk about your case, maybe give some informal counsel. And in the literature on false confessions, I cite a lot of it on the website. So that would be a place for people to, uh, to find where they could do further reading if they're interested in the subject. Okay, very good. And also, I'd just like to plug, if anyone out there has falsely confessed and was convicted and is now free and would like to tell their story on this show, I'd love to have you on. So contact me. Um, Alan, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for sharing and talking about false confessions. Like I said at the start, I think this is definitely an area of the criminal justice system where there is a lot of injustice and there's not nearly enough uh, sunlight shed on it. So thank you for taking some time. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, John. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for the show today, guys. I want to thank Alan Hirsch once again for coming on and talking about false confessions. You know, this really is an area in the criminal justice system that hardly gets any exposure and is not talked about that much. And I think, as Alan talked about during the podcast, I think it's really something that a lot of people just assume, you know, maybe it's a very, very small problem and it only impacts, you know, people who aren't intelligent or who have some problems and they don't know what they're confessing to and are just taken advantage of. Um, I don't think a lot of people ever think that it could come down to them being coerced into falsely confessing to a crime that they did not commit. But I think, Alan, what he talked about today, I think really proves it could really happen to anyone. And it's something that we need, need to shine light on. And that's why I'm glad that Alan Hirsch agreed to come on the show. I want to encourage everyone to check out Alan's website, The Truth About False Confessions. There is a ton of information there. You could read it for weeks on weeks on weeks. So please check that out. And remember, everyone, if you like the show, please subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. You can find actually a link to subscribe on the show notes page at lionswithliberty.com slash FF23. And please be sure, if you like the show, please share it with your friends. Share it on social media. You can email it out, whatever you want to do, guys. If you like the show, the reason that I do these shows, the reasons that I speak into this microphone, the reason that I bring on guests like Alan Hirsch, the reason I bring on guests like Aaron Murphy last week talking about DNA evidence and DNA typing is because I want people to know I want a light shined on these injustices. So please, if you notice this injustice, if you like this content, please share it with your friends because they'll like it too. I'm sure they will. And it, if you're looking for an audience, if you're looking for more people like you who uh, want criminal justice reform, who are libertarian leaning, who love liberty, please, I encourage you to check out the Lions of Liberty Forum. That is our private Facebook group, guys. You can find it on Facebook. In the search bar at the top, just type in Lions of Liberty Forum and it'll pop up. You can click join. It's a private group, so we do have to prove you to get in. But as long as you don't look like a psychopath, that shouldn't be a problem. And I think that's it. I also want to encourage anyone, if you have any ideas for guests to bring on the show, you can send them to felonyfriday at lionsofliberty.com. That's my email address. And that's all for today. As always, thank you, everyone, for listening. This is John Odermatt signing off. Always remember to keep your head up and the fires of liberty burning.